There's a lot of up and ups and downs in the college football world over the week, over the past, I don't know, 10 days or so, depending on your program or maybe your rival's program of who's up and who's down. So we're going to take a Sunday stock report today on the Daily Huddle of just who is stock is rising and whose stock is dropping, in some cases dropping dramatically. And then we'll also give you a look at the Sunday Stiff Arm Trophy update because there's some shuffling in the Heisman Trophy race. First, when we take a look at whose stock is up today, I think, one, we're going to start with Oklahoma. Oklahoma stock rapidly rising because it was one of those feeling out processes yesterday of, or I guess even up to yesterday, of what was Oklahoma. 6-0 and now at this point after a tough, hard-fought win over Texas, 34-30. But when you look at their schedule coming into that game, Arkansas State, SMU, Tulsa, Cincinnati, Iowa State doesn't really instill a whole lot of like, this is one of the best teams in the country. They were ranked 12th for a reason and because I think people still conflated last year's results with a lackluster schedule before the Red River rivalry. I think they proved yesterday that they are a very, very good team. Texas, I'm still really high on and I... The popular thing at any point right now is to write somebody out of the college football playoff race the second that they get a loss. And I don't think you should do that until somebody gets a second loss. There is a path to Alabama making the college football playoff. There's a path to Texas making the college football playoff. Is that path closed for Notre Dame? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But for everybody else that doesn't have two losses, if you are in a Power 5 conference and you are currently in the top I don't know, 20, and you've only got one loss, there's a path for you to get to the college football playoff. So Texas is still involved, but Oklahoma, that's a really big win. They got blown out last year at against Texas. They got beat up. And at the time, and, and really all the way through the end of, of the college football season and through the off season, there were questions about whether Oklahoma made a mistake hiring Brent Venables. And I have a friend who's a radio host in Oklahoma and said, we are not very far away from being elite and everybody's writing us off because we had a not great first year under a first year head coach, but Oklahoma's not far away from being elite is what he told me last year. And they're 6-0. and They just beat what I think coming into the week yesterday was the best team in the country, the best, the team that had the best resume, the team that had the best win, the team that would have been at the top of my top 25 ballot was Texas. And Oklahoma got a goal line stand that will be remembered for a long time in those circles. And that is a very, very, very big win for OU. And we talked about the schedule. It it doesn't really get all that much more difficult. They're off next week. UCF at Kansas, at Oklahoma State, West Virginia, at BYU, TCU. That is not an especially tough schedule from here on out. Might be premature, but it might be time to start considering a 12-0 and Oklahoma going into the Big 12 championship game against an 11-1 and Texas. It just might be time to start kicking that around. Also this week, I think Georgia's stock is up because they had taken a lot of, a lot of shots for not being great and I don't know that they're not great as much as they are not up to snuff and not up to what they have been the last couple of years you beat South Carolina by 10 Auburn by seven last week and people were questioning myself included whether they should be ranked the top team in the country now they're ranked number one because they get the benefit of the doubt you win back-to-back -back national championships you're going to be ranked number one it's just the product of the system but I don't know that they had played like the number one team in America so far I think that's really Pretty clear. And yet they were still ranked number one. And they looked like a buzzsaw last night. 
Kentucky is not bad. I think they're probably slightly overrated at the number 20 team in the country, but they're they're they were five and oh coming into the game and got some love. Now, somewhat similar to I don't know if it's somewhat similar to Oklahoma. Kentucky was just five and oh, and they got in the top 25 because they beat Florida pretty handedly, who was in the top 25 before that. But they're not a bad team. Are they the second best team in the SEC East? Probably not. I would I would say Tennessee probably takes that for me, but we'll find that out on the field. But that was a a dominant Georgia victory. Dominant Georgia victory. They win 51-13, lead 34-7 at the half. Pure domination is exactly what Georgia needed in that moment, and so to get it, at a time against a top 25 opponent matters and to look that good is going to go a long way in helping change the perception of how we should or could be viewing them. I think UCLA deserves a little love today. Bruins are four and one. They beat Washington state who was ranked 13th and UCLA's their their loss was a seven point loss at Utah, which when you only score seven points, it's gonna be hard to win. But as they're transitioning and getting set to move to the Big Ten, UCLA needs to build some momentum and getting a win last night over a top fifteen program. And I think similarly to Kentucky, I think Washington State probably a little overrated. But UCLA scores 13 points in the fourth quarter to come from behind to beat Washington State. It's a it's a big win for UCLA because I think I think they're probably going to be ranked in the top 25 when it comes out. And when you can have one of those numbers next to your name, it just does a whole lot of wonders for how people look at you, how people view you, whether your game is big on Saturday or not. It matters. And for them to beat Washington State, one, I think it's a tough, tough loss for Washington State. You blow up lead there in the fourth quarter, and and then UCLA gets a fork down stop to, to win the game. That's a tough, tough spot to be in for Washington State. But UCLA going to climb back in the top 25 with that win and are kind of sneaky good. The uh, the Ball State transfer, uh, Carson Steele, who you know, I think there are a lot of people that are like, wait, UCLA is going to start a kid that was the starting running back at Ball State? Yeah, Carson Steele had 140 yards rushing on Saturday on 30 carries. They're just flat out relying on the kid to put him on the back and go get it done. And he did. It's a big win for the Euclid Bruins. On the flip side, I think Kentucky got a lot of love and a lot of attention and similar and Washington state did too. I think Louisville got a lot of hate this week for being the number 25 team, ranked team in the country. And maybe it's just where I'm located, but the, the consternation was that Maryland should have been number 25 And the fact that they weren't ranked while LSU still was ranked was bullcrap. And Louisville didn't even deserve to be in the top 25. Well, I think Louisville showed that they deserve to be in the top 25. The score on the final scoreboard is 33-20. And that's much closer than the actual game was. Because from start to finish, Louisville dominated Notre Dame. Audric Estime was the leading rusher in the country coming into this week and could not do anything. Sam Hartman hadn't thrown an interception all season, threw three picks last night. It was pure domination for Louisville from start to finish. Just flat out shoved Notre Dame around, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Louisville flew to the football. Notre Dame had no answer, and I, that it restarts the questions, I think. And, and it's it's a bad spot for Notre Dame to be in, right? Because they're, they're in a stretch of playing four straight-ranked opponents where you've got to get up and get ready to go to be 
part of the deal of playing at Notre Dame is you're going to be somebody. You're going to be everybody's Super Bowl for the most part. That game was Louisville's Super Bowl last night. And to Notre Dame, it was a just another blip on the radar, just another game we got to play. And when you get in that situation, it's tough to overcome that because if one side is hyped up and amped up, ready to go, because it matters a whole hell of a lot if they beat you or not, it's tough to counter that with like, oh, yeah, you you guys exist. <laughs> it's just a tough spot to be at. And I think if Notre Dame could have went three and one in that stretch, it's not a bad it's not a bad look for them. The problem is, is right now they're one and two in that stretch and have USC to go. So four straight ranked opponents, which regardless of your thoughts, your feelings on Notre Dame's schedule, playing four in a row, two of them back to back on the road is a difficult spot to be in. Louisville just handled it better than Notre Dame did. And whether they're the beneficiary of the scheduling or whatever, I don't know, don't necessarily care. The job is to go out and win the game that's put in front of you. And Louisville did that impressively. And so I think have a lot to be excited about. And finally, on the stock up spot, Michigan's really good. Like, really good. And I say that the week before they play like Indiana and Michigan state back to back, which means at some point, like they're going to lose to somebody they shouldn't. And they still have two really big games left on the schedule with Penn state and Ohio state. Michigan's really good. And they're handling their business right now. And it's not, and you can argue, you know, the fact that they haven't played a close game is an issue. Oh my gosh. You know, they're, they're winning games by 35 points. It's ridiculous that they're not, you know, by the time they play a close game, you know, they're not going to have that experience. I think if I had to choose between having the experience of playing somebody tight or beating them 52 to 10, that feels like a pretty easy decision to make to me. So while there are still two very big, I guess three really big games for Michigan State, because while Michigan State is not ranked, no matter when Michigan and Michigan State get together, it's an important game, and it's going to be a big game. So they have three really big games left. They've given up 10 points. As the hot, Like last night, Minnesota scored more points on Michigan than they've given up in any single game so far this season at 10. Now, they haven't played the 27 Yankees or anything like that, but still, they are impressive and have a lot to be really proud of, excited about, and are moving in the right direction. And I think their stock is, despite being ranked as the number two team in the country, their stock is still rising. And similarly to Georgia, I think that's a, that's a, a rough spot to be in if you've got them still left on the schedule. Now, on the trending downside, the stock downs today. First, we have to, I think, start with Miami. For the first time in a while, there was excitement for Miami football that even though they were ranked 17th, they were undefeated, hadn't really played a tough schedule, but did have the home, the nice win over Texas A&M. But they were 4-0. Mario Cristobal had that thing rolling. And with less than 40 seconds on the clock, their opponent, Georgia Tech, had no timeouts. All they had to do was kneel the football, and they win the game. They're 5-0, and and they're ranked in the top 15 today. Instead, apparently Mario Cristobal has an aversion to taking a knee. I don't, I don't know that there is a way to explain how or why that that is a really stupid thought process to have. I saw a tweet today and I thought it was really funny. It said like you college football coaches before they get hired, like you should have to toss them a PS3 controller, give them a game situation in NCAA 14 with a, like you're up three with a minute 30 to go. You got the football. Your opponent has one timeout. If you don't win the game, you don't get hired because with under 40 seconds to go, and you need to snap the football one more time to win. Despite, I don't know how you say, ah, we don't kneel the football. <laughs> we don't do that. 
Well, now you're owing one in the conference. You're now lost your first game of the year to a school who got boat raced by Bowling Green last week. They fumble the football, which it, it seems somewhat clear that the running back's elbow was down, but nonetheless, you fumble the football. Georgia Tech then goes 76 yards in 24 seconds or whatever to beat you. The viral clip of one of your defensive linemen sitting on the bench going, what in the bleep are we doing? What in the bleep are we doing? All because you were like, ah, we don't kneel the football here. We run it right there, right down people's throats. Well, how did that work out for you? It's just a really, and believe me, I am somebody who, if you can show me why conventional wisdom sucks, I will buck con conventional wisdom. In a heartbeat, I don't know what the bucking of the trend of conventional wisdom when we're going to run the football to run the clock out. What all you got to do is snap the ball one more time in a one-score game. Generally, when somebody makes a coaching decision, there are like two sides of like, at least I can see, okay, I understand what you were trying to do. I understand your thought process. In this one, it's just like Mario Cristobal's a dumbass is essentially <laughs> what it boils down to. Like that's literally, <laughs> that's literally what the kind of options are is either he didn't know that it was a one score game that there was under 40 seconds left. His opponent had no more timeouts and all they had to do was take a knee, which still is in dumbass tech territory. Or he just thought, ah, oh, we're just going to run it out of what are the chances we fumble and then they score a few plays later to beat us. Both are dumbass attacks. Both are really, really bad. And it's really easy to jump on that pile right now because everybody's doing it. But it's so dumb. It's stupid. How dumb can you be? And I, like, I know that there are people like this. That's a fireable offense. Okay, first of all, no, it's not. They lost a football game to a bad team. Georgia Tech is not good. Certifiably not good. But the fact you were even in that game with them is like, ah, what are you doing? But to just say, ah, like, ah, we're better than running. We're better than taking a knee. We're going to run the ball. I don't get it. And if there was any, some, some pathway to defending it, I would. But I can't, so I don't. Also trending down. I think USC, despite getting a win, is trending downward. At some point, like I, I, I'm, I very rarely, if ever, am I going to call for somebody's job? Am I going to say, this person deserves to be fired? And I'm not going to do that with USC defensive coordinator Alex Grinch. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say that he should be fired because who the hell am I to say what should and shouldn't happen inside that program? But in back-to-back -back weeks, you've given up 41 points. They play Notre Dame and Utah back-to-back -back in the next two weeks. And then they play Washington, Oregon, and UCLA in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back weeks to end the season. At some point, they're going to be forced to make a defensive coordinator change because they've given up like 50 points. Like I, the, the likelihood of Washington and or Oregon putting up 50 points on USC is incredibly high. Very high likelihood that those two schools are getting to 50 against USC. Now, if USC can get to 60, it doesn't matter. But at some point in the college football season, you're going to have to stop somebody. You're going to have to limit somebody and hang in your hat on like, well, we held Nevada to 14. Great. Congrats. When you have Utah, Notre Dame back to back and Washington, Oregon and UCLA back to back to back to back. Good luck. But their complete like lack of interest in playing defense at USC is going to be their downfall. They are still undefeated and they're going to drop in the rankings. Because you play a tight, tight ball game with Arizona last night. And no disrespect to Arizona, don't really have any business being in a one-score game, in a tied game, going to overtime on the road at USC. There's just different talent levels there. And 
to Arizona's credit, had a great game plan. And to USC's defense's downfall, I don't know that they had a game plan as much as it's just like, ah, whatever. As long as we've got 11 guys on the field, it's okay. We just need to give our offense a little bit of time to rest. If you can hold them up before, like if you, as long as you don't open the door and hold it for them, like they're walking into a grocery store, that's great. And you would think that a top 10 team that had national championship aspirations and a player who's the reigning Heisman Trophy winner and is almost a surefire number one overall pick in next year's NFL draft would have a higher standard than like, uh, as long as there are 11 human beings on the field and we kind of just get in their way a little bit, that's a win. USC is never going to be a national championship contender with the with the defense that they have that's that bad right now. It's just never going to happen. As great as the offense is and as great as Caleb Williams is, Williams is he only threw one touchdown last night and it was an absolute dot on the move. It was poetry in motion on a football field. As great as that is, it, you're never going to be able to compete for a national championship when your defense has given up 41 in back-to-back weeks to Arizona, Colorado, gave up 28 to Arizona State, gave 28 to San Jose State. You're just never going to be to the caliber that you need to be if that is the standard that you're going to get to. Also trending down is Texas. If you're going to tell me that Texas is back, Texas has to win that game yesterday. You have to find a way to win. You get four plays at the goal line with an opportunity to go to to extend a lead. You got to do it in a big rivalry game in your home state against a team that you just beat the piss out of last year. You have to find a way to win that game, and they didn't. Now I said earlier, I mentioned earlier, but Texas still has a very straightforward path to the national to the college football playoff. Win the rest of your games, beat Oklahoma in the Big Ten Big 12 championship game, and you're in. Because Texas is gonna get the benefit of the doubt. Texas has the best win in America right now on the road at Alabama. Those they just that fact rests with the burn orange. And of the losses if anybody has I, I, they now have the second worst loss, the second best loss. Alabama has the best loss. Texas, who beat Alabama, has the second best loss. So the stock is down, but I'm not selling it necessarily. I'm I'm willing to ride through the roller coaster, ride through the dip with Texas, because I'm not certain how many schools in America are going to be able to beat Texas, Oklahoma. You know, neutral site is one of them. And still, I think there's going to be question marks of like, oh, man, is it, is it, is that, is, is Texas back? I think, yes, Texas is back, but it's a tough, tough loss yesterday to stomach and one that's going to stick with you for a while, I think, especially if somewhere down the line it ends up being the, Loss that keeps you from winning the last Big 12 championship, making a college football playoff, whatever the case may be. That's a rough loss for the Longhorns. But I think they can kind of get through that. I think Notre Dame, on the flip side of the Louisville game, and I don't want to just like, okay, for everybody that was up, the team that they beat is down. Notre Dame's stock is dropping a little bit, that there were flaws with the team. Like, Notre Dame is the opposite of Ohio State has like a, an abundance of playmakers on the outside and at running back. They've got just a couple of guys that run different styles and their offensive line is not very good. And the quarterback is just OK, where Notre Dame has a OK offensive line, a couple of really good running backs, a really good quarterback and their wide receivers aren't very good. <laughs> There's just if you were to merge those two teams, they would be an absolute juggernaut offensively. But that's not the way it works. So Notre Dame is a team that's trending down a little bit for me. Washington State, I think, was a little highly ranked, a little too highly ranked. 
to be frank, now they they got to that spot because they beat Oregon State the week before in a tight game where there's a lot of excitement around Oregon State and I think Washington State. I think people want those underdog stories, those two schools that are going to get left behind by everybody else to be, you know, the two teams that end up playing each other in the Pac-12 championship game. I don't think it's going to happen, but it sure would be awesome. But I think Washington State just a slightly overranked and got beat by a Herculean effort from UCLA yesterday. My final stock down is Fresno State. Ranked in the top 25. People bitching that you shouldn't, you didn't deserve to be ranked in the top 25. And they go and lay an absolute egg and lose to Wyoming. And, you know, give give the Cowboys some credit. Five and oh, got win, got a win over ter- four and one, five and one. I beg your pardon, five and one. Uh, four, five and oh in the uh, Mountain West standings there that they lost at Texas in a game that was kind of sneaky close going into the fourth quarter, but they beat Texas Tech earlier in the season, and now they have a win over top 25 Fresno State. Fresno State, the path was in front of you to be the group of five school to play in the New Year's Six game and really accelerate, accentuate that program and be a lot, have a lot to be excited about because I, I, I kind of like a sneaky like Fresno State. I like the, uh, you know, back of the day in the Pat Hill, David Carr era where they're playing kind of late at night and almost that Hawaii time slot and just slinging the football around, having some fun. It's a sneaky, fun little spot. And they had the path lined up for them to make the New Year six. And instead, that that path has kind of gone for them now. If if Tulane keeps on a winning, Fresno State ain't got anything to hang your hat at. They last lost on the road at Wyoming. You're not going to get that benefit of the doubt anymore. So that's my final stock down on this Sunday. The Daily Huddle on Saturday Glory. I'm Garrett Seawright. Appreciate you making us a part of your day, however it is, wherever it is you're doing so. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you're not missing any of the great college football content we're pumping out here on Saturday Glory. And if you're listening on a podcast, drop a five-star review. It goes a really long way in helping out the podcast. Every Sunday, I'll tell you who's at the top, the second and third spots in my Heisman Trophy balloting. And there's no change at number one because he didn't do anything to to deserve dropping Michael Penix jr. Washington was off yesterday. He's still number one. I think Caleb Williams, despite I I don't even know if you can call it a lackluster game. It was like 19 of 25 and a couple hundred yards and a touchdown. And the touchdown he threw was a beauty. I don't think you can say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to drop Caleb Williams from my Eisman trophy list. He didn't do anything to deserve to be dropped. I, I did take Sam Hartman off because I, I had mentioned that the longer Notre Dame stays in the college football playoff hunt, the more credit Sam Hartman's going to get and the more attention he's going to get as the reason for why they are playing the way that they are and the excitement level is the way that it is for Sam Hartman. And then yesterday they lose a game by two touchdowns and he threw three picks and it was like, Nah, that didn't go. That didn't go so well. So I did drop Sam Hartman from my third spot. I put Ohio State wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. I think it's undeniable, and this is potential bias talking. I think it's undeniable that Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best football player in college football. When you look at who does their job the best, it's Marvin Harrison Jr. and it's not close. And at some point. You have to reward that. He went eight catches, 163 yards, and a touchdown yesterday and scored on back-to-back plays where one of them got uh, one of them got overturned on a kind of not great penalty call. So he, he scored twice, did the same celebration back-to-back. Eight for 163 and a touchdown. He's undeniably the best player in college football, and so I, I, I have to include him in my top three going forward. And he also is kind of nursing a bum ankle. You go eight for 163 in a tutty on a rough ankle. I got to put you, I got to put you on the list. 
So that's the Sunday Stiff Arm Trophy update. That'll do it for today's episode of the Daily Huddle. Back at it tomorrow. More college football to talk. Want to hear from you? Tweet me at Garrett Seawright and at Saturday Glory to share your thoughts, your opinions, your feelings. Want to hear from you? Hit us up. That'll do it for today. We'll catch you tomorrow right here on the Daily Huddle on Saturday Glory.